How's my uh, head position? Looks great. Okay. We're rolling? You bet. Okay. Ready, camera one. Three, two, one. Take one. At one point, out of a morbid sense of curiosity, I asked my GP what my life expectancy would be. And I seem to recall the numbers nine to 14 months. Well, all I could think about was that wasn't gonna be me. From the first day I was in there, I was determined to beat this thing. And four years later, I'm even more determined. I'm more determined than ever that <laughs> oh no! Uh, no. <laughs> After four years. After four years, I don't have anything to say. Ready on two. Roll tape. You've got speed. Doctor Peter, take one. As it turns out, I had no shortage of things to say. I feel quite privileged to have had the opportunity to say them. It's given me a chance to practice medicine in a very unconventional way. And I hope I've been able to help and educate people through television. It's been a lot of fun doing the diaries, quite rewarding. A lot of changes have taken place over the last two years. And when I look back, I realize just how many significant changes have been captured on tape. In 1986, Peter Jepson Young, a Canadian physician, was told he had AIDS. Unable to practice medicine because of the debilitating effects of his disease, he began a weekly segment on a television newscast in order to combat prejudice about AIDS and homosexuality. For many, Peter Jepson Young was the first gay person they had ever known, and certainly the first to be stricken by AIDS. Over two years, viewers grew close to him and accepted him into their lives. He became affectionately known as Dr. Peter. The following program is made from the 111 weekly broadcasts of Dr. Peter. In September of 89, I noticed a subtle change in the vision of my right eye. I saw the ophthalmologist that week and was diagnosed as having a viral retinitis. The virus is a very common one, something most people have, exposed, have been exposed to and it, it stays in your system. If you have a normal immune system, it's not a problem. But when your immune system is screwed up, as is mine, the virus can manifest itself in several ways, one of which is an infection of the retina. Within six weeks, I lost the vision in my right eye and then realized there was a problem with my left when I started tripping over the garbage can in my office and, and then on one occasion walked into my secretary's desk. She looked up at me and asked me if I'd been drinking. The infection was diagnosed in my left eye and I was started on treatment in December. The treatment is a toxic medication which has to be given intravenously on a daily basis. It's not a cure, it doesn't kill the virus, it just prevents it from growing. It perhaps bought me a bit of time with my vision, but I saw the ophthalmologist last week and he told me that so much of the retina is dead that the nerve which connects the eye to the brain is dying as well. What I see now is a small area of central vision in my left eye, like a small window that's getting cloudier and smaller all the time. When I was first diagnosed, the concept of going blind was too unreal. But it's an eventuality that I have to face now. I grew up in a middle-class family, spending my teenage years in this North Shore neighborhood. These are the playing fields across the street from the high school I attended. It was a conservative, academically geared high school, not a welcoming place for a gay teenager. In a similar fashion, I didn't feel that I could discuss my sexuality with my parents. For me, I'd been gay since I could remember. It was just a normal part of who I was but I knew that they wouldn't take that view. They're a product of their generation and the cultural stereotypes they'd been fed. It was a large part of my life I couldn't share with them. 
and I got to be 29 years old and had never dated women, and they didn't ask. I wouldn't have lied if they had. I'd spoken before about the trouble that I was having with my vision and described it as looking through a small window that was getting smaller and cloudier. Well, that window's gone now. In other words, I'm completely blind. About two weeks ago, I woke up one morning and didn't know it was sunny outside. I had to call a friend to find out what the weather was up to. I no longer distinguish night from day. I don't need to turn the lights on in my apartment. It's not blackness that I see. It's sort of a heavy gray, like being in a very thick fog that you know isn't going to clear. When I was in hospital, there was a period of time during which it seemed uncertain whether I would be getting out of there at all. My mother, who is a quietly religious woman, had concerns that, that I didn't have any beliefs in God and that because of this I was going to be very fearful about dying. I explained to her that I did have beliefs and that I wasn't afraid of dying. I've never bought into organized religion. I've always felt that a sense of spirituality is a much more personal thing. I didn't really have a, a formulation in mind of, of what it was I, I believed in, but I knew that, that I had some beliefs. I grappled with this over the next six months, and it seemed to all come together for me on one perfect spring day when I was at Long Beach on Vancouver Island with some friends. It was warm, the surface pounding on the sand, and I decided to take off on my own for a while. I stood there looking around and thinking, how much better can it get than this? I wanted to be able to recapture this moment for future reference, because I knew that I would be facing some difficult times. I also wanted to get a sense of being able to draw in some of the forces that were around me to help me heal myself. So I climbed up on a big rock and lay down in the sun, closed my eyes, and this is what I came up with. I accept and absorb all the strength of the earth to keep my body hard and strong. I accept and absorb all the energy of the sun to keep my mind sharp and bright. I accept and absorb all the life force of the ocean to cleanse my body and bring me life. I accept and absorb all the power of the wind to cleanse my spirit and bring me strength of purpose. I accept and absorb all the mystery of the heavens, for I am a part of that vast unknown. I believe God to be all these elements and the force that unites them. And from these elements I have come, and to these elements I shall return. But the energy that is me will not be lost. But a year and a half ago, I was diagnosed as having Kaposi sarcoma. I just had a few spots. They weren't a problem. This is what a typical KS lesion looks like. It's a different sort of cancer. It's generally a, an oval, purplish spot on the skin, and usually it just causes a cosmetic problem. But I had a patch on this leg. It was like a little bruise. It was more diffuse than the other one. And I guess in the past few weeks, it, since I've been blind, it's become more aggressive and has spread to cover a larger area. And what it's doing is it's blocking the, the fluid flow from the tissues so I can push my fingers into my shin and make a dent there. It also is a little painful. It feels like shin splints. I had radiation treatment on it a couple of weeks ago. It's going to take another eight weeks or so to see the results. 
AIDS used to be considered a death sentence. I don't believe that. AIDS is not a focus in my life. It tends to be a bit of a nuisance. In spite of being blind and having this problem with my leg, I've got a very full life and, and generally, I'm pretty healthy. Around the time that I was losing the last of my vision, and before I went on television, we had some adjustments to make in the family. And my sister decided that she would have to discuss my situation with her children. She has twins who are seven and a son who's eight. My dad was concerned that they were going to ask some, well, potentially embarrassing questions about how I got this and where I got this, etc. And I didn't have a lot of experience with talking to kids about AIDS. So my sister and I did a little bit of research and, and they decided that the approach that they were going to take was, was very basic. So one day she and my brother-in-law sat down with the kids telling them they wanted to have a talk. And my brother-in-law said, have you kids heard about AIDS? My one nephew said, well that's an infection, isn't it? My brother-in-law said yes. And then my other nephew said, and that's what Uncle Peter has, isn't it? Well, my sister and brother-in-law were completely taken aback by this. And they said, well, yes. And then my niece said, and that's why he's going blind, isn't it? And they said yes. The kids asked a few more questions, but basically the information they wanted was, was very basic. They're quite intrigued now by the fact that I can't see them. And I think they've realized, particularly my niece, that because I can't see them, they have to be more physical, more touchy and cuddly. And she'll play games with me, cutting out different things that I have to identify. It's quite interesting. It hasn't affected our relationship, at, certainly not for the worst and possibly for the better. I guess. They love their Uncle Peter, and in spite of the fact that I'm blind or have AIDS, in their innocence, they're very accepting. In the time that, that I've been blind, I've met a few new people, including uh, one in particular who's become very special in my life. And it's interesting because I've never seen him. So I wasn't able to form an opinion based on the superficial things, on his appearance, the clothes he wears, the car he drives, etc. Instead, what comes through is just a very clear picture of what a great person he is. It may sound corny and maybe a bad pun, but being blind has been a real eye-opener for me. This is Harvey. Harvey is a Canadian guide dog for the blind. I just got Harvey a few days ago, and right now we're, well, actually it's me that's being trained. Harvey's already trained. Harvey's from Ottawa. He used to be a cabinet minister, but he decided to quit politics and get a real job. Right, Harvey? Let's go. Okay, forward. Good boy. Find the way, Harvey. Straight on. Find the way. Well, here I am. I finally made it up the mountain. My first time skiing since I've gone blind. Turn down a little. Down a little. There you go. Okay. You're Straight up. through. Okay. You're well on the course. You got 50 yards in front of you. Okay. Turn. Right. Turn. You're right in the middle of the course. There you go. 
Okay, I've hit one tree so far, but it wasn't wasn't that bad. And I was feeling a bit of a bit out of breath, and I don't know whether that was physical exertion or sheer terror. But I'm getting used to it. How was it? Good, huh? And the whole concept of of having that freedom again really really opens up doors. I feel now that the only limitations I'm going to have are the ones that I put on myself. Now all I have to do is convince them to let me drive home. Well, look where I've landed. Back in the same hospital room I was in over four and a half years ago when I was first diagnosed with AIDS. Why am I here? Well, it's a bit of a long story, and I'll try and make it as straightforward as possible. For the past three months, I've been on a drug called alpha interferon to treat my age-related cancer, Kaposi sarcoma. It didn't seem to be doing the trick, so we decided to switch to chemotherapy. I had my first dose two weeks ago. Now, I had no immediate problems with it, but chemotherapy can slow down the growth of cells in your bone marrow and therefore white and red blood cells circulating in your body. Last week, I had a fever. Initially, I thought it was the flu. Everyone else around me seemed to have it. But on the third night, the fever was so high and I felt so crummy that I decided to come into emergency. They did some blood tests and they found that there was bacteria growing in my blood. When you have very low white blood cell counts, you can get an infection such as this from something as simple as a, a shaving cut or a pimple. There's nothing there to fight off the bacteria. They get into your blood, get frisky, and start multiplying like rabbits. And then you end up here. There's a lot of other scary possibilities when you have a fever and AIDS. I didn't have any other symptoms, no pain anywhere. So they really didn't know where to look immediately. They cultured everything and they wanted to rule out the possibility of all kinds of nasty things. But the infection that I have is a common one. It's a skin bacteria called Staph or Staphylococcus and it's easily treated with intravenous antibiotics. It's certainly not going to do me in but tomorrow's lunch, the salmon surprise, just might. I don't know what's happening lately. I've got a number of friends who have AIDS or who have HIV infection. And for some reason in the last couple of months, it just seems that so many of them have become stricken with very serious problems. A whole variety of things, it depends on the person. It's hard for me because, of course, I think they were fine two months ago and now they're having a very difficult time. What's in store for me in two months? But it's also difficult because I don't really know how to help them sometimes. Sometimes I feel that oh, all I have to offer are platitudes, maybe anecdotes about some of my experiences. I don't think it's very convincing when I'm telling a friend who has the same infection that caused me to go blind, that bl being blind really isn't all that bad. I don't know what I can do for them sometimes. I guess it's just a matter of giving support. But when you get a whole bunch of people doing poorly all of a sudden, it's difficult not to be pessimistic sometimes. Five, four, and two. That's right. Right? And it's the low one. The day that I found out I was going to lose the vision that I had left, I decided that I wanted to start to play the piano again. It was something that I'd done as a child, but I hadn't taken lessons since I finished high school and hadn't really had access to a piano. So on the way home from the hospital, I stopped into a piano place and made arrangements for a rental, went out and bought some music, and then started to plunk away. It was, it was a lot of fun and very rewarding, but I didn't get 
particularly good at it. And then the vision that I had started dwindling away to the point that I couldn't read the music anymore. Well, then I still had this piano, and I, I had this crazy idea that because I'd gone blind, I would have suddenly acquired an ability to pick pieces out by, by ear. And I discovered that that wasn't so at all. So I thought about taking piano lessons, but I really wasn't sure what the options were. I knew there was Braille music, but that sounded rather difficult. So I, I didn't really do much for a year. But about two months ago, I finally decided to make the move and start taking lessons again. It's low. Uh-huh. Up and down again. Oh, okay, okay. And now what we do is my teacher reads out the, the notes onto tape. We tape the lessons, and then I can go over them again and again at home. It's a really different feeling than reading music. I'm not intimidated by the music. I'm not intimidated by the numbers of sharps or flats or difficult chords that are coming up. So I really feel that I'd be able to play whatever I want to at the rate that we're doing it by just going through a piece and by feeling it much more than I used to. Yesterday I had extremely high fevers and nausea. I wasn't able to keep anything down and I got quite dehydrated. So I landed in here. Not my favorite place, but I felt much better once I got here. There's always the fear that there's something else going on. Just because you've got one illness doesn't mean you can't get another. And this is the reality for many people with AIDS. In many respects, I've been lucky. The things I've had to deal with have come one at a time. For many of my friends, they've come one on top of another, kind of an avalanche effect. And I was afraid yesterday that, that was, that's what was happening. I really wasn't sure what was going on. But once I got in here, I had a chance to talk to my doctor, got hooked up to some intravenous fluids and so on. I felt much better, much safer. And then when I woke up this morning with no fever and an appetite again, I felt infinitely better. Feeling the way I did yesterday, I can certainly understand how a long, drawn-out illness would make one just want to say, bye-bye, it's too much trouble to stick around. The way I'm feeling today I've got a lot more fight in me. Is, is there anything else you want? You want some fruit? Sure. Is there any peaches? No, I think there's some peaches and there's apples. I've got my nine-year-old niece staying with me for a couple of weeks. She's attending an art camp at Granville Island. So, okay. all of a sudden, I'm a pseudo-parent. It sure gave me new appreciation of what it is to be a parent. There's a lot of things that you don't think about. This person is quite dependent on you in a lot of ways. You've got to feed them, keep them clean, get them to bed, amuse them. All kinds of different things to, that what, uh, are difficult to, enough sometimes to do for yourself. That, that little Tupperware thing? Yeah. Okay. Is that where you put them in? But regardless of how you're feeling yourself, you've got to be there for this other person. Now, our relationship is perhaps a bit different than that of the average adult and child because I'm depending on her to a certain degree. Being blind, she can be my eyes. And so I might be dependent on her in other ways. So, a pair of kings? Um, yeah. Okay. Now, <clears throat> do you have um, a six? Oh, yeah, I do. <laughs> 
Three weeks ago, I was water skiing at Shawnigan Lake. Some people felt it couldn't be done, but I did get up, and I had a lot of fun. At the same time, I was trying not to think about the possibility of having Kaposi's sarcoma, an AIDS-related cancer in my throat. Earlier that week, I'd had a CAT scan of my neck. I hadn't spoken to the doctor about the results, but I was pretty sure that this is what the problem was. In the subsequent three weeks, the diagnosis has been made, and I've had the therapy, a radiation treatment. Now, radiation doesn't hurt when you're getting it. There can be some side effects, like quite marked fatigue, and the hoarseness of my voice, a bit of sore throat. And there's a bit of a wait and see period before you know exactly what kind of results you're gonna get. As my health deteriorated, I felt that I should get my affairs in order. One of the things I wanted to do was to write a living will so this fall, I gathered together those people that I had selected to carry out this responsibility. My sister and brother-in-law, two close friends from medical school, and another close friend. So basically, you know what this outline is, is just to give us some idea about what the four of you are going to be doing in making decisions about... Um, well, about my medical care when I can't make the decisions. I mean, do you have any problems with making those kinds of decisions? I don't know. I guess I sort of see Richard in my role as, as having a perspective into the medical treatment and looking to, to Nancy, Lionel, and Andy to say, um, mm -hmm. to sort of support us in what our impression of what Peter's wishes would be. I mean, I think we know Peter pretty well as a friend and have a pretty good idea of what he'd want done, but it'd be really nice to have you guys say, yes, I agree with that. Well, I think it's really comforting to have both of you to lean on to say, you know, what is this procedure going to be and would it be uncomfortable, is it necessary, whatever. I think it's, it's really comforting to, to have you both involved in that decision making. One of the other things that, that's mentioned is that the issue of perhaps um, being signed out of hospital, um, you know, against uh, medical advice. Part of our discussion here yeah. has to deal with what are your wishes. Is it your wish that you would rather be at home definitely when you die as opposed mm -hmm. to being in the hospital? And that we should be conscious of that. Yes. yes. Ultimately, I, I want to be sort of <clears throat> in my own bed. Preferably a large four-poster bed. <laughs> <laughs> Mansion. With, with, with like a dozen down cushions. <laughs> oh yeah, we'll just uh, top, fix top that down for you. <laughs> with with like a red velvet, you know, bedspread. Red velvet. Really <laughs> <tired. Yeah. laughs> well, no, I'm thinking of sort of like Ebenezer Scrooge, you know. Oh, no. But hundreds, hundreds of weeping relatives around. Where are we going to find a hundred of weeping relatives? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Where well, are you going to find two? Seven or eight. Seven or eight. Seven or eight. Seven or eight. I woke up on Sunday morning feeling quite restless because I was short of breath. I hooked up to the oxygen that I had at home, but that really didn't help. Lying here doing nothing, even with the oxygen on, I was still short of breath. I was really working hard to breathe, really pulling. I got a true sense of what it must be like to have a bad asthma attack. And I started getting scared. I told my sister that this was happening and that I wanted to call the specialist about where I should go. At the same time, it was discovered that the oxygen tank was a quarter full. That meant only another 15 or 20 minutes. That's when things started to get a little panicky. 
it was decided that I should go into St. Paul's emergency. And the oxygen tank ran out literally as we arrived at the door. A Kaposi sarcoma that, that I have, an AIDS-related cancer, has started growing very quickly in the last little while. Perhaps it's not growing any faster than it had before, but because the total number of cells has increased, every time that number of cells doubles, there's just that much more to battle. And it's gotten to the point where it's outstripped the efforts that we've made to keep it under control. I got this news last week when I went to see my cancer specialist. She was a bit concerned with how quickly things were progressing. Concerned about the fact that there's some of this Kaposi sarcoma in my lungs. Concerned that it has developed very quickly in my right hand just over the course of the last week to the point where the hand is, is quite stiff. I tried playing the piano with it yesterday and had a great deal of difficulty because of the stiffness. We decided that because of the speed at which things were progressing, we'd have to change the therapy. So I switched to a new chemotherapy agent, one that I take at nighttime every day for a couple of weeks. It carries a, a high risk of losing my hair, but Considering the potential benefits of it, it's really not something to be that concerned about. I have been feeling healthier and stronger the last few days. And because of this, I was able to speak at a benefit the other night for the Vancouver Meal Society, an organization that delivers hot meals to people that are homebound with AIDS. Now this evening was one of a variety of different type of performers. It was a band, a juggler, poet, and an interpretive dancer. performance, well, how, how do I explain it? Part of the evening was, it was an AIDS awareness evening, and I was the AIDS awareness part of the evening. So what I decided to do was blend together my interpretive dance with a lesson on HIV infection. Now, I've always envisioned interpretive dance to involve being in some kind of bag. I, I, you, have you ever been to any Anna Wyman performances, you know? So, um, I brought my duvet cover. Um, it was the biggest bag I could find at home. Um, HIV infection. I will now represent the HIV virus. Now, once inside the body, it finds these other cells. These are cells that help fight off infection. And they kind of worm around like this. And the virus is really attracted to them. And it, it binds onto them. And it, the, vi the cell says, come on inside. So the virus comes inside. And then there's all this hanky-panky that goes on. in the production of new viruses. So, basically, the best way to avoid this kind of thing is to climb inside your duvet cover <laughs> and you'll be protected. Thank you.
knew that I was attracted to men from a very young age. Actually, a couple of years before my peers began discovering sexuality. So I couldn't discuss it with them. I couldn't discuss it with my family. When my friends started talking about women, girls, I thought, well, this is all well and good, but I'm not that interested. I couldn't relate. I thought maybe this was some kind of phase that I was going through. So I decided that maybe I could convert myself. So I drag out my dad's Playboy magazines and thumb through them, looking at the pictures. When I discovered that I was spending more time looking at the fully clothed Marlboro man than I was looking at the completely naked female centerfold, I realized that's not what I was interested in. And it wasn't something that I was going to be able to change. So I put that all away and decided that this was something that was going to have to be on hold. My mother gave me a copy of Ann Lander's Talks to Teenagers About Sex. There was a chapter in there on homosexuality. I can't remember the gist of most of it. I do remember the last line, however. It went something like this. Well, just thank God that you're normal. And I thought, who has she written this for? It was just devastating. I wonder how many children of the 50s read that very line and were completely crushed as I was. Recently, I visited St. Peter's Quamachin, an Anglican church on Vancouver Island, just an hour north of Victoria. We're just going to go up. I went with my parents, and we met the rector, a Father Logan McNanamy. I'm just standing in front of the altar. How is your vision? I have nothing. Nothing now? Yeah. Okay. Church is a place you don't need any vision anyway. No, that's right. <laughs> And watching you and, and listening to you on television, there, there's a, an inner strength there, and um, a love that you that keeps you going, and that you you want to share with others, and you do that through your diaries. Um, can you say something about your own spirituality? My sp spirituality is is a sense of um, really belonging to. Um, uh, to yourself and to what's around. Um, you know, I really believe that um, that the force, whatever you want to call it, God, um, Buddha, is is in all of us and is everywhere, and that. Um, to be truly spiritual, you've got to be in touch with all sorts of different levels. The reason we went there was because it's the cemetery of this church that I have chosen as my final resting place. So this is the spot down here? Yeah. Just to watch as a peg there. Mm. This is a very important day today for us to be here. One of my fears when Peter was first ill was what we would do if he should die. To have a minister like Logan to share this with us and the Anglican Church being so accepting, it's a wonderful gift. It's a very tough time right now. Mm -hmm. It may seem unusual that I've chosen to be buried in such a rural setting, but really this is a corner of the world that I'm very comfortable with, having spent many years growing up in this area. 
I see coming back here not so much an ending, but rather a homecoming. I was in hospital for five days last week. Another touch of pneumonia. Since I've been home, I've still had some pretty bad days. I'm needing more oxygen than I did before, even just to lie around. And particularly when I've got a fever. The fever's We've been trying to figure out what's been going on there for quite some time and haven't found any answers. So they just have to be tolerated when they happen. But when they happen, it's not very easy to tolerate. It's difficult to cope with sometimes. You never know what your day is going to be like. You might wake up with no fever, and it looks like everything's going to be fine. Two hours later, you might be burning up. And in my circumstances, that makes a huge difference in what I can do, how much I can move around. It's getting to be a real struggle. Okay. I've got a speaking engagement this afternoon, and I'm going to have to go out. Um, this involves going down a flight of stairs in my building. Okay. Do you want to take a little rest? Yep. No. Oh, I do. He's <laughs> <laughs> old man. I don't know. Well, this was <laughs> this was, was nerve wracking going up last time. The concept of having to use a wheelchair. I don't know why, but. I thought this was a a real step away from independence. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But I come to realize in the last couple of weeks that I don't have a whole lot of choice. On November fifteenth, nineteen ninety two. Two weeks after his last public appearance, Dr. Peter Jepson Young died at home. Dr. Peter's memorial service was held in Vancouver at Christ Church Cathedral. It was attended by his family and friends and those who knew him only from his two years of television journals. Peter was my very special friend, my partner, and my lover. As we met many of you people on the street, as we read many of your letters that came in to us, I realized that Peter was your very special friend, your partner, your lover, your brother, your son, your uncle, your grandson. He gave us an identifiable face a face for us all to see. On behalf of Peter, thank you for the love and support you gave him. As his words made a difference to our lives, your love made a difference to his. I invite you to stand and join with me in saying Peter's affirmation. I accept and absorb all the strength of the earth to keep my body hard and strong. I accept and absorb all the energy of the sun to keep my mind sharp and bright. I accept and absorb all the life force of the ocean to cleanse my body and bring me life. I accept and absorb 
all the power of the wind to cleanse my spirit and bring me strength of purpose. I accept and absorb all the mystery of the heavens because I'm a part of that vast unknown. I believe God to be all these elements and the force that unites them. From these elements I have come, to these elements I shall return, but the energy that is me will never be lost. 